no C. No, we were just there together, but I have now joined uh, or I have been joined by Danny Herzberg of Slack. Um, this is going to be a really, really exciting talk. Uh, I mentioned a little bit a couple of minutes ago what the types of things are that we're going to be covering. Um, we'll, we'll give a couple of minutes here just to make sure that if anyone is trickling in just in time for Danny's fireside chat that they are here to catch all the good stuff. Um, yeah, so I'll give a bit of a, an intro here on Danny. So she is the Senior Director of Sales at Slack. Um, she oversees a team of 80 inside and field sales reps, managers, and directors across five geographies at Slack. And at HubSpot, she joined as employee 80 through IPO and spent almost six years in sales and product leadership there. So some really incredible experience with two really huge companies in, in SaaS. So um, definitely somebody that I'm really looking forward to kind of learning from here. Danny, how's it going today? Thanks, Sarah. I feel great after that intro. How are you? Nice. Great. Yeah. Looking forward to, to the rest of On Your Growth and, and looking forward to having you as our, our first speaker of the day. Um, yeah. Great talk to start off the day. I love that you guys are using a Slack community and that's a core part of how we're interacting today. Mm. So I signed that's in. Right. I have a workspace set up on my Slack. Ready to go. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. So I will actually point out then, um, if you guys haven't yet joined that Slack community, um, you can do so at, uh, well, we've shared the link, so I won't try to speak out the link. The link is there in the YouTube. You can join there um, to sign up for the Slack community. And Danny will be hanging out for 15 minutes after her talk here to answer any questions that don't get answered um, in, in her session. And uh, it's a great place to, to chat with any of the speakers after their sessions. It's a great place to chat to each other and, and learn some stuff. So make sure that you join that Slack community. Cool. And I'm just going to butt in and say hello. Hey, Danny, it's good to see you. Um, I'm just, I'm going to be representing uh, chat, YouTube chat. So if, uh, if people are asking questions, I'll kill my video to stay out of your way, but fireside chat. So I figured, hey, I'll be the guy managing, poking the fire, I guess. I don't know, but I'll get out of the way. Um, <laughs> I might, I might throw, jump in with some questions here and there, but I didn't want you to be like, where the hell is that voice coming from? <laughs> I appreciate putting a face to the name. Thank you. Awesome. Right, well, you, let's, yeah, let's get started. Um, Danny, you began your sales, your tech and sales career at HubSpot, which is a high growth company out of Boston. And now you've spent the last three years at Slack. What drew you to Slack when you first joined? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this already, but I joined HubSpot really early, um, which was kind of just fortunate timing in my career. And it was a really unbelievable place to start. Um, when I joined, we were literally working out of the co-working space. So we didn't have our own office yet. We spent my first year there in the co-working space. And what I was realizing is that when you join a high growth company that already has some momentum, but, but it's ready to step on the gas, you basically get the chance to reinvent yourself over and over. And the company is hopefully growing faster than you can. So that afforded me some great career opportunities. When I was done with that chapter, I knew I wanted to join a similar type of company because it just kind of, it fits my level of patience and my ambition. And um, there are a number of reasons that I landed on Slack, but it was my, my absolute dream company. The way that I thought about it was a couple of things. One, HubSpot moved me to San Francisco to open the office here. And when I landed here about seven years ago, there was one big theme emerging from all the top performing companies. And that was this new go-to-market approach um, where you give away the software for free forever and somehow still find a way to make money off of it and build a growing, thriving company. So this was like a, a novel concept at the time, it's premium companies. And I was very curious because I still saw these freemium SaaS companies layering in sales over time. And what I figured was I'm going to become a, a dinosaur if I don't figure out how to build, shape, be part of the freemium to enterprise playbook, because that's definitely the next wave of how software is going to be sold. So my eyes were appealed for um, companies doing that. I also had this hypothesis. Um, after HubSpot. So after HubSpot, I went to business school. During business school, you have plenty of time to think and dream about what's next and what's the ideal scenario. And my hypothesis was, I want to build the enterprise division of a consumer tech company. And the thought was this, I love everything about building and scaling sales orgs. There was so much I loved about HubSpot. If I could change one thing, it would be selling something 
um, that everyone can relate to and that I can personally feel passionate about as a user. And, um, you know, and I thought about my friends outside of tech and, and being able to discuss work with, with people outside of this world. And so that's where I landed there. So I spent my MBA summer at Airbnb. And what I very quickly learned was that I could rule out this hypothesis. And um, I learned that by realizing that at most consumer tech companies, enterprise is an important, perhaps lucrative side project. And I like high pressure, high stakes scenarios. I like to be part of the revenue engine of a company. And at a consumer company, the founders are up at night thinking about the consumer product and how to grow through product and marketing. And so that helped steer me back into B2B and enter Slack. I see this freemium trend growing. Um, and then I see this consumer style, but squarely B2B enterprise company emerging. And it was absolutely the place that I wanted to join, let alone the people that had already attracted that I wanted to work with. So I, I basically jumped in asking very few questions and three and a half, years, three and a half, almost three and a half years later, uh, just no regrets. It's been amazing. Awesome. So it sounds like you, you found the right company to tick all those boxes that you were looking for. Yes. Yeah. I feel really grateful for that. Amazing. So what would you say is the most important part of your job as a sales leader at Slack? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, when I'm doing a good job in my role, I can rattle that off really quickly, but I think any leader's role is to be able to know what are my big bets, keep it to two to three max, or it's going to be really hard to focus. So here are my three. Number one, um, attract, develop, um, retain, and then hopefully inspire top talent. So it's really number one is, is build and grow the team. Uh, number two uh, is drive focus and clarity. And then number three is build relationships with key cross-functional stakeholders and drive alignment cross-functionally. And so I can dig into each of those a little bit. Um, you know, even when you're selling a product like Slack or HubSpot, the engine doesn't really work unless you have the right team in place. And so I'm constantly thinking about recruiting, promoting, backfilling, grooming someone to step into that stretch role that they want. Um, and this kind of means always holding a vision of what the org needs today and what it will need next fiscal year. And you're holding both of those at the same time um, because each year gives us a chance to prepare for the next one. So that's how I'm thinking about the talent. Um, in terms of driving focus and clarity, I believe reps and leaders of my team just want clear direction. And it's really hard to sift through what's noise, what matters, um, there's abundance of options at any company of whom to prospect into. Um, and, you know, perhaps at later stage companies, what trainings to attend, where to really invest your time. And so my job is to make it super clear. This is what's important. This is a high value investment of your time. Here's our ideal customer profile. Here's our play for going after that. And I spend uh, a good amount of my time and energy making that crystal clear for the entire team. Um, one of the ways that we do that is at the start of the year, I do this with my leadership team. We come up with our priorities for the year. And then I basically sound like a broken record throughout the year. We all do, but we reinforce those over and over like any rep, you know, anyone on the team it, with their eyes closed can say what our priorities are this year. And the way that we, we reinforce that beyond just saying it is um, we build it into the structure of our team meetings. It's what we celebrate when we're celebrating things off the dashboards and we live those values and priorities. And the way that we arrive at them in the first place, if anyone's thinking through this, is um, what is my org, what does the company need of me this year differently from last year? Like the contrast I think is very helpful to say, what is this year all about? And then that, that helps drive the ship. Amazing. I want to take this opportunity to remind you guys, sales leaders watching right now, um, ask your questions if you have them. Colin is monitoring that live chat in YouTube. He'll he'll pipe up and ask some questions of Danny. So if you if you have questions for a highly successful sales leader who has managed tons of different people at two really exciting companies, make sure to get those in. Um, okay, next question. Uh, what part of your job is mm, excites you the most right now? I like that question. Um, 
right now, in my specific role, I am most excited about um, something that we just launched that's called Slack Connect, and I think it's relevant to everyone who's in the line. So the idea of Slack Connect is basically, you know, you're all familiar with how you use Slack internally to, to communicate with your teams. Um, now we can use that externally with prospects and customers in a secure way. And to me, this is an absolute game changer. Uh, so I'm watching reps on my team build really meaningful rapport through Slack with their prospects. They get really speedy responses from customers. They remove all the formalities that used to exist when we were selling through email or even through Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it's also very rewarding because I get to see and hear from customers, especially the, the smaller and mid-sized customers report back saying, I landed a million plus dollar deal for myself by inviting a prospect into Slack. I would have never been able to do that without building that kind of rapport. So that, that feels really good. You know, we, we sold a product that was always wall to wall, meaning an entire company could use it. But I think as sales professionals, it feels really good when we can sell something that we deeply, that we deeply relate to in our own profession. So, um, so I'm, I'm very bullish about that and what it means for, for us and, and how we reinvent the modern sales playbook and, um, and what it means for our customers. Yeah, that is very exciting. I can't wait to see when that, you know, people start to adopt that. I think you're right. It is a, it's a total game changer. That's not a medium that salespeople have had to use before. What an exciting thing to have, yeah, to have been a part of bringing to the world. Um, it's out there. I mean, I, I interviewed yesterday, um, you'll see it um, uh, at our conference frontiers. I'm, I'm interviewing a friend, an amazing uh, female sales leader, Jean DeWitt Grosser, who leads revenue at Stripe. And, you know, they're, they're using it across their company with their customers and prospects. And so you'll see it out in the, out in the wild, but I'm pretty stoked about it. So cool. Uh, what part of your job is the most challenging right now? Okay. You started with the easier question. Um, well, so I, I assume there's a mix of people on the line right now. Um, I'll start by saying, if you are an individual contributor, your job is hard right now. You cannot fly out to meet your prospects and customers. You can't take them to dinner. You can't walk the halls of their office. Um, you're prospecting maybe alone in a one bedroom apartment. Like That's hard. Um, if you're a leader, your job is hard, really hard right now. We don't have a playbook for this. We um, you know, are carrying a lot of load. So I, I would say for me personally, the hardest part of my job right now is I'm kind of, um, I'm an in-person person. I say this at a remote first company, but I just am like, so before this eight of the nine teams that I've overseen at Slack were outside of San Francisco where I'm based. And I always thought it was worthwhile to fly in. Um, there didn't really need to be a reason. Sometimes I fly in just for a day and I get to have, you know, impromptu coffee chats with people. I get to sense the spirit of the office. I get to sense what's happening on the sales floor, you know, how people are working together, whether they needed a boost of motivation or something else. And um, it's really hard to recreate that uh, in the absence of being with your actual team in person. And not to mention a lot of extroverts gravitate towards sales. So I'm thinking about the people who are on, um, on the leadership team and the sellers and like, People aren't necessarily in their happy place. So how do we recreate that virtually is a big question on my mind. And we're trying, I'm, I'm very open, um, you know, in chat or in questions that you guys ask to suggestions you have. What we've tried so far is we have something called Donut and I cherish Donut. Donut basically is like a, a, a robot matchmaker in Slack. And every two weeks, you know, in my org, I'm randomly paired and, and all peers are randomly paired. Um, with someone for coffee talk. And usually I take that as a walk and talk with my AirPods and we can talk about work. We don't have to talk about work. That's a really great way to connect. And then we have the donut bot going in our senior leadership group. We have it in a bunch of our different um, channels and groups, but that's that's been really good. And then the other thing we've done is kind of like um, no work talk breakfasts or lunches. Sometimes they have prompts. Sometimes you post a photo of yourself during your awkward teen years, you know, whatever the icebreaker is. 
but we're finding other ways to recreate what would have happened, you know, over a shared meal together or an impromptu conversation in the office. And that's, that's been a really nice start for me. Hard nonetheless. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Absolutely. chat's jumping in here. Um, so we got a question from Travis Tyler uh, for Danny. Um, what have been some of the biggest differences in your experience from at, at, in sales at HubSpot, Airbnb, Slack? They're all so different. So here's how I would categorize it, especially while I was at HubSpot. HubSpot was a sales and marketing driven company, first and foremost. Even the CEO has a background in sales um, and we were selling a marketing product. So the ethos of the company was very much, um, you know, this like content marketing, thought leadership driven, um, and then top down sale. And, and you also just, you felt that at the company is like sale, sales matured as an organization and marketing matured as an organization well before the product team did. I would say our, our product renaissance happened um, when we acquired a company called Performable led by David Cancel, who's now CEO of Drift. And, um, and then we really started doubling down on product, but it, it, it was very sales driven at HubSpot. It was also, um, very SMB focused. So the deal sizes were much smaller. You had a much higher volume. Um, you got to know your prospects in some ways on an, on a very personal level because it was business owners really opening up. Um, and then meanwhile, I'll, I'll contrast it with Slack. Slack is a product-driven company. I mean, that's what I was seeking out. But as a sales leader or salesperson, that requires some humility. It means you don't get to walk around and pound your chest and take all the credit for the growth of the company. It means you have to respect product and understand that you know, they're, they're a critical part of the engine behind the growth. And so I found it really interesting to join um, also, the, the buyers are different in a product-driven growth company. You can expect that they are um, more knowledgeable about your product because oftentimes they've used it. They've used it for free for a year or years before you get the chance to talk to them. So the expectation for how well you know it and how you can add value completely changes. Whereas at HubSpot, the sale was much more, you know, starting from the very beginning, like well before you introduce the product into the conversation, you are educating them on the shift to digital marketing and um, you're kind of just helping them understand where they have opportunities to grow with or without your software. So it, it, it's just a, it's a very different sale, also different personas you're targeting between um, an IT buyer within Slack sale and um, a marketing buyer um, historically in the HubSpot sale. And then Airbnb, I didn't answer. Airbnb, we were selling to business travel managers. Um, which it's hard. Um, that's, that's not a very high leverage position to be in. It's not a very risk-taking position. So when you're selling something that's kind of like, um, new and exciting and playful and like, you know, who knows what the living room is going to look like that you end up in for your travel as a management consultant, that may appeal to certain employees, but that's not necessarily what business travel managers are aiming, are, are aiming to solve for. So that, that was a really tricky sell too. Yeah, that's, that's fair. You're, you, you got really cool value on something that is very low on their sort of order of priorities. Um, I'm yeah. jumping in because we get a couple questions. We got another one from uh, Gerardo and he's asking, uh, they're asking, what are you doing to recreate, re-energize the team? Um, in the, in the remote office or remote work culture? I'm welcoming all suggestions from the team. Um, so first of all, you know, so some of my favorite ideas are from reps who go out on a limb and, and send me a direct message late at night. So I was thinking the team needs this. What do you think about that? Um, so I encourage you, you know, anyone who's on the line who has ideas perhaps for their leaders, do share those because it's not like we have all the answers right now. I listed off some of them. I think what people are craving most um, are two of the things that I said are important to me as a leader. One is clarity. So like, what's important? How should I be spending my time? How do I focus? And so that's how I try to structure our meetings. That's what I try to reinforce. I also think, um, you know, we in sales like to be celebrated. We like to be recognized. And so we're really big on celebrating anything that's worth celebrating right now, which means, you know, 
reps on my team sell very large, very large deals at times, but that doesn't make a 10 K contract that was hard fought where a customer is, you know, really excited to bring on Slack. Like we want to celebrate that too. So, uh, we get quite playful. We record zoom videos, um, making the rep blush, basically like playing some pump up music, um, interviewing them on, you know, how they brought the customer on board, posting that everyone chimes in and celebrates those kind of things are really, really critical. And then we do some of the things that, like I said, are off the dashboard, just getting to know each other as individuals, finding new ways to connect. Um, my all hands on Tuesday, um, we were tapping into our competitive spirits. Everyone um, took a photo or everyone, everyone found a photo of themselves um, or something that represented competition to them. And we had people, um, dragon boat racing. We had professional rugby baseball players. We had someone who was on a mountain bike limboing, like literally under a, a limbo <laughs> hole. Um, we had people being inspired by stories in the news. And that was a really fun way to just, you know, emphasize what's important right now. What's the spirit we want to tap into, but also get to know each other a little bit as we kicked off the meeting. So there's a few ideas. Awesome. Thank you for that. We've got another question. Uh, from Stephanie is asking, do you feel that you need direct sales experience to be a successful sales manager? Um, it, direct versus indirect as in, as in channel versus selling, or just does one need to carry a bag before they can lead a sales team? I, that that's how I interpreted it. But Danny, if you're, or sorry, Stephanie, if you're in the chat, uh, let me know, uh, just sales experience in general is what she's saying. So yeah. carried a bag. I think it helps. Um, I, I don't believe in check boxes on resumes for any role. So I, I don't believe that someone ever has to have done something to have a shot at being good at it, but I sure think it helps both for credibility and empathy. So let's say, um, let's say you haven't had sales experience, but you know, you want to step into leadership or you're at a more mature point in your career and you want to pivot that into sales leadership versus product leadership. What I would say is if I step, you know, if I found uh, perhaps an early stage founder who just needs kind of a general athlete to step into the role, learn, figure out what other people are doing and, um, and bring on our first 100,000 customers. Um, I've seen that done before. What I would recommend to that sales leader is carry your own bag while you build the team because you want to fumble through all the things that the reps are going to fumble through and number one, they're going to look up to you and give you much more credibility if you know what you're talking about on that front. And number two, it's going to help you understand what needs to be streamlined as you scale your organization. And so, and I would say one of the best sales leaders that I know, period, um, OJ, who leads sales at Asana, I believe, OJ, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, if you hear this afterward, I, I believe when he joined Dropbox, he, he led online inside sales at Dropbox. Um, when Suche recruited him into the role, he had never sold or been a sales leader before. But I actually met him because he was so curious in that role. He came in with such a learner's mindset um, that he was just picking everyone's brain around him. Anyone that his investors or friends would introduce him to, he would invite them into Dropbox's beautiful office and we'd whiteboard together and he would come up with his own philosophy. So it's possible and you can go on to be an amazing sales leader, but it helps to do the job before, you know, before you lead a team doing it. Totally. And sorry, Sarah, I feel like I'm stealing your job here. Do you want to take this one from Slack that's in the Zoom chat here? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So that, are we going with the, yeah, we got rock okay, from just Slack. done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the question for Danny is inbound or outbound. If a company doesn't have either, which would you recommend setting up first? Which of the two is most important to tackle first? That's tough. Um, well, you're never going to meet a sales rep who doesn't want to join a company that already has inbound leads. But I think the most important exercise for, uh, for a leadership team to go through, let's say CEO to go through um, with his or her um, you know, sounding boards is what is my ideal customer profile? Uh, because sometimes you get inbound leads, but it's noise. You're getting inbound leads from very small businesses who have lots of questions for you. They're going to take up a lot of your time. 
but in fact, you're building a product that's geared toward mid-market or enterprise. So step number one, think through who is your ideal customer profile. I would think about their function, um, their seniority level, their pain points, and then I would make some educated guesses about their style. How do they like to be educated and buy? And we can use, you know, my, my personal examples for this. Um, HubSpot, or sorry, Slack originally um, gained traction with tech and dev teams. So software developers, DevOps leaders, et cetera. You can make a prediction about their style that generally will pan out, which is they would pay me money not to talk to me. They don't want to talk to a sales rep. They want to see a piece of, of software in action they are sharp enough to figure it out on their own, technical enough to figure it out on their own. They wanted to integrate with other systems that they're using every day, like Jira, et cetera, and um, get as much value out of it as possible um, in, in a touchless way. So that would be an argument for freemium, which was not one of your questions. Um, then let's take inbound versus outbound. Let's say I'm targeting a marketer. Well, marketers put out content and marketers also read and consume content. So uh, the thought leadership route, which would over time yield inbound leads, if you have a great content engine through social media, through a blog, et cetera, and that's starting, and, and you're investing in some pay per click, um, and that's starting to drive traffic to your website, and then use use your website as a place to keep them engaged, educate them on the problems that that they're thinking through, and that you help solve, even tangentially, and you pull them into your funnel. Uh, that would be a very good persona to bring in as an inbound lead. Um, outbound is important no matter what. And at any point in company, you know, at, for every single company at some point, you will embrace an outbound motion. My team certainly embraces an outbound motion, despite the fact that there are inbound leads and there is a supply of premium. So um would I make an SDR my very first hire if I were an early stage founder? No, uh, I want someone slightly more senior who's more interested in helping shape the direction of the product at that point than I do someone who's just cold calling a bunch of people and pitching per se or trying to land a meeting. Um, but do I think an outbound motion is critical for being proactive about getting in front of the type of audience that you actually wanna to sell to that that you decided was your ICP? Yes. And so, um, so the answer is the earlier you can build that muscle, the better, because then no one becomes reliant on inbound leads. Um, but the answer is also you need to invest in the marketing machine uh, that will build up enough thought leadership and make it easy enough for people to, to land on your website and convert. Cool. We have one more here from Tashi. Uh, what do you do with reps who are burned out re with remote working how would a successful sales leader motivate the rep to kickstart his meetings? That's a good question, Tashi. Um, I don't know if I have a blanket answer for this. And, and this is something I want to tap into with my own team too. Um, first, what I would want to do is, is create enough psychological safety on the team that someone feels comfortable saying, you know me, you know I'm a hard worker but I'm, I'm either on the brink of burnout or I'm there. Um, so create a space where they can raise that with their manager. And, and then I would inquire and I would say, you know, what's weighing on you? What's making, when's the last time you felt energized in your role? What do you think it would take, you know, to, to tap back into that? And you kind of co-create a plan with that person. So certainly mental health days are a real thing. Um, incur, you know, what we've done, actually the SMB team launched something really creative. They had um, like a self-care mental health contest uh, within our culture channel in Slack. And I don't remember the point system, but it was something like you get one point if you use a face mask, you get two points if you do, if you do physical activity that gets your endorphins going, you get three points if you complete a book. All these things that we know help us take care of ourselves gamify that, encourage it, actually tell people to post photos of themselves doing it and celebrate it and give credit. And I think that's a really good step, but that's, that's a slightly more blanketed, playful approach. I, I do think I, I would take it one by one. And, and Tashi, if you're personally feeling it, I don't know, I don't know you or your role, 
Um, but I would look for an opportunity to, to share that information um, with my leader and, and talk through what my needs are and, and brainstorm how to tap back into that motivation. Thanks for answering those, Danny. And guys, if you've got any more, feel free to put them in the live chat. But another question I have for you, Danny, is we're currently in a buyer-centric world. How do you approach different buyers and all the different stages of their journey? Happy to answer that. Do you guys see the sun is, I'm in San Francisco, <laughs> the sun is rising. It's like pouring in through the door. <laughs> um, so buyer-centric world is right. I mean, we're, we're, we are selling in a completely different in, environment than our predecessors did. Um, I think in, in a really exciting way that keeps us on our toes. Um, so gone are the days where we can hide behind a deck and where we have all of the power as salespeople showcasing a product. You know, the, we can assume that all buyers have heard of our product or are frantically, you know, Googling how we compare to competitors while we're talking on the phone or on Zoom. Um, and they're armed with a lot of information. Um, what it means, so I, I kind of was, was alluding to this earlier, but um, more than ever, you need to put yourself in the shoes of the buyer and understand who they are and what they care about. And so I had given the example of, um, you know, what, what I can assume a um, software leader cares about or how they would prefer to buy in their, you know, in their buyer centric world, which is give them the tool for free, gain credit, you know, show, don't tell in terms of credibility, let them play with it. And then, um, be ready to meet them where they are when they have questions and they need help navigating, you know, a more political buying cycle. If it's, if it's at, at a larger company, um, let's use another example that I haven't given yet, uh, HR leaders. So, um, if I am selling to HR leaders, I can make the assumption that most of the products um, that they buy are going to need to be extremely secure and highly compliant, particularly as you move up market and what you sell. So knowing that, I'm probably not going to launch a freemium SaaS business. I'm probably not going to call a bunch of employees and do interviews and say, you know, Hey, mid-market sales rep, do you think we should use Workday or something else for HRIS? That's not how it works. So think about who they are. Um, and then I would, I would come into that conversation prepared to preempt any questions or objections they have. And I would use my website, my entire presence and brand to preempt that. So let's say um, I know I want to sell to enterprise companies. I want to sell to companies you name it, above 5,000 employees is my bare minimum. Uh, my website needs to showcase logos of companies that are their size or larger, you know, ones that they aspire to look like that silently validates, you're not gonna be our beta user. You're not gonna be our biggest customer who we're experimenting with. Uh, and we are gonna, you know, show all of our um, security certifications and other things that provide proof of things that they're going to need. Amazing. What, uh, what changes about a sales cycle when you move up market? Um, so what should change about the way a sales org is structured in order to meet those new demands? Yeah, I, I started alluding to this. Um, I would say a sales cycle up market requires more stakeholders involved, almost always. Um, therefore, it requires multi-threading to make sure you're not isolated to one point of contact, even if that contact tells you they're driving the decision. And so and what I would encourage everyone to do here is think about what it's been like to work at a bigger company versus a small one, if you can contrast those experiences. When you're at an early stage startup or a small company, you're small, you're scrappy, you want something affordable that does 80% of the things that you're looking for. You don't have complex systems to integrate with. You're not overly focused on security. You don't need to have three meetings and then a meeting before and after the meeting to decide about a piece of software. So you're nimble, you can make decisions um, a whole lot faster as sales cycles tend to be much shorter and fewer stakeholders are involved. Up market, you do, you need to have all those meetings. Decisions are political and they have many dependencies. So it's not enough to have a champion when you're selling into the enterprise. You need to understand who your economic buyer is. You need to get a sense of who will be around the table um, when the discussion is had. 
um, and how your tool stack ranks in the priority list compared to other initiatives they have going on. You want to understand, will it replace existing software? So, you know, is there a cost cutting play? Will it integrate with what this company is already invested in? Those are all questions that become very relevant as you start to move up market. For sure. And you've certainly got the experience at that wide range at, at both of these companies targeting all of these different types of companies. So guys, um, oh, it looks like we do have a question here. Okay. So this one is from Jocelyn. Um, would it be better for either sales and or marketing to work a more sustainable ethical practice and to promote sustainable ethical concepts that respect their markets? So I guess that's more towards the, the buyer centric question that we had. And, and what do you mean by sustainable and ethical? Gosh, that's a bad question to ask. What do you mean by ethical, Jocelyn? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there was, I, I think I copy and pasted incorrectly here. So basically okay. um, referring to sort of with movements like the, the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that, the, everything that's happened sort of more recently, um, I guess, what's the role of a sales and marketing organization and should they take a stand on one side or the other? I believe we should. Uh, it has to be authentic to the company. Uh, so one thing I think is that all CEOs need to stand for something right now. You know, just thinking about the millennial and the next generation of the workforce, um, we care deeply about what our company and what the people behind it believe in and, you know, what, what impact we're making on the world. And so I think, um, you know, you can't fake your way into this. You have to self-educate. You have to develop your own opinions. Uh, but I do believe that, that an executive leadership team uh, should, should be vocal about what they stand for. Um, personally, I really appreciate my experience as a consumer when I see a company putting that um, front and center. So for example, I, I'm ordering food delivery all the time. Um, on Caviar or DoorDash, there's often, um, what, I, what I've recently seen is like a, a section up at the very top front and center that says black owned restaurants. And you know, you better believe I'm gonna scroll through those first. So that's a really great way to practice what you preach on that front. Um, but yes, yeah, so step number one is, uh, it, let's say you're a job seeker figure out who the people are and what the company is that you're working for. What signals have they given you? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak out of both sides of my mouth at the same time, work is not going to be your everything, you know, your, your CEO, your brand, like those are not your, those are not your best friends. Those are not your family. Um, if we want true diversity, it means that we need to be comfortable with people who have different belief sets than we do at our company. So hopefully we share values, but we may have different opinions and sometimes starkly different opinions. So you also need to have a very open mind and be comfortable with that. That's my thought. Cool. Good answer. Um, I'm going to do uh, the last couple of questions that I've got for Danny here. Um, if there are any of the ones that we missed from you guys, remember that Danny is going to be in the Slack community for 15 minutes after this. So she will get to those questions as well. Um, Danny, what do most people get wrong when approaching a big new client? Hmm. I think um, they make it about themselves. So when, when approaching a big new client, one of the keys to success is doing your homework. You want to come up with an informed point of view. So what does this company do? Who do they compete with? What might be an existential threat for them? How can you pressure test whether this is true? What customer stories will versus won't be relatable? Those are all the questions that you need to ask yourself when you're doing your homework. And doing the homework is a really critical step here. If you had, you know, if you step in uh, to a big client meeting and you pitch and you spend more of the time talking than you do listening, you've probably lost that opportunity. And that's why I love these tools like, you know, gong and chorus and anything that holds a mirror up to your face and actually shows you whether you're being the kind of active listener you want to be and whether you've prepared and, and, and you're getting good feedback. That's all very helpful. Um, so I, I'd say the, the summary would be focus on them, blow them away with your insight into what they might need 
earn the right to ask the harder questions about their pain points, their priorities, and you'll set yourself up on a really good path with a big client. And there, there aren't very, very many female sales leaders. We can see that you guys watching you, you're on LinkedIn. You see that, um, that LinkedIn, you know, feed is dominated mostly by male sales leaders. Um, what do you think Danny is the reason behind that? And what can we do to change that? Well, I have a very genuinely optimistic stance on this right now, which is that is very, very much changing. So that's the good news. Um, in terms of how do we get here? Why, why is it off balance right now? I would venture to guess that it stems from uh, a few things, but some of it is just what sales looked like historically. So, you know, as recently as two decades ago, sales was a traveling job. And I remember when I moved out here, I talked to a CEO of, you know, public company, um, very much known for, for building a quintessential sales org. And I asked him about, you know, what made it unique. And the examples he gave me were so telling that he was like, well, first of all, every salesperson had to shave his face. You must wear a tie. Um, and as you move up the ladder, uh, your family will be moved. So, you know, I, I have my leaders move location every couple of years because I find that a good salesperson and a good sales leader is never too comfortable in their job. So that, that answer kind of says it all. Like no one's ever told me to shave my face and put on a tie that that probably means that most people who entered in back then were men there were also probably fewer dual income households at the time if i ever told my husband that my job would require us to move every two years i don't know where i just know that the ceo wants me to be uncomfortable you know he would, he would look at me like a crazy person and it would be really hard for both of us to pursue our careers that we're passionate about um so luckily, I think that's changing. I think uh, the rise of inside sales is great. I think um, I think there are many more women entering into the sales force and being encouraged to progress. Um, and uh, and then I think the more of us step into leadership, the more examples we have. That you know this this is what it looks like. It's you know I've I've had a, a baby while being a sales leader. It was great to me. I mean, <laughs> you know. Maybe I put the twist on it that I want to put, but to me, I was like, well, when I step out for maternity leave, all of these amazing, capable leaders uh, who work on my team are going to get a chance to shine and get these stretch assignments that were probably long overdue, get great exposure, and people are going to get to see them in action. So, like, you know, to have to have parents as sales leaders, regardless of it's a, a male or a female, I think is really empowering um, to the next line. Um, and, and to everyone else. And then, um, like I said, it's changing. I mentioned Jean earlier. Um, I, can, I can name tens of remarkable uh, women, sales leader, um, women sales leaders today who are uh, just doing a stellar job and should be speaking on every panel and, and, and can become your mentors, whether you meet them or not, you know, listen to their podcasts, get a sense of how they think and operate. Uh, Amanda Kleha is another one. She's chief customer officer at Figma. She leads not only all of sales, but all of marketing too. So talk about big job, uh, mm -hmm. but there's, there's plenty of us out there and it's changing. And the thing that we can all do is we need to get sales, um, sales needs better marketing as a profession. And I think we need that starting at the undergrad level. So for whatever reason, when I was graduating undergrad, I thought the only ways to start my career were banking and management consulting. And that's just totally untrue. There's a much more fun, fulfilling and equally lucrative way to do it and that's sales. But we need to help teach that in the sales classroom. We need to rebrand it as intellectual. Um, next step is we need to go into MBA programs and teach sales as a viable career path. And then I think we're going to start seeing a whole lot more balance of, of who enters into the profession, not just across gender, but I want to see it across race and other, uh, and other elements of diversity too. Amazing. Well, Danny, thank you so much for this fireside chat. Incredibly enlightening sales leaders out there. Uh, you've got so much to kind of chew on here. Um, we tackled so many different topics from how to target your buyer to how to scale your team to, to how to address, you know, this zoom fatigue and, and the, the lack of uh, motivation that your reps might feel right now. Um, if you do have any remaining questions for Danny, put them in that Slack channel. So, uh, 
we've got that link for you there. And if you're up for watching the next talk, uh, just hang out in the live stream and you can do that. Uh, Danny, yeah, thank you so much for being our, our first speaker of the day for this uh, edition of Own Your Growth. It was really wonderful having you. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this is a fantastic summit. I was really honored to join and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Danny. Bye.